Yes, uh, we are ready. It's already live on Facebook right now. Yes. Farah, would you like to begin? I think Sujata will start. Yeah, Are you ready, really Sujata? Yeah. I can't hear you. Yeah, is it clear? Meena, yes. Is it okay. A very, very warm welcome to our guest speaker, Mr. Shakti Tarur, a diplomat, writer, politician. A warm welcome to Dr. Nandita Krishna, author and activist, president of C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer Foundation, and Mrs. Farah Bangera, a very close friend. A very warm welcome to all the IVA members and the Madras Book Club members. They've joined us on Zoom too. So this is a hybrid meeting where we have uh, members of the Duchess Club seated in the hall at Savera and also joining on Zoom. So we welcome each and everyone. There, they all are waving their hands. Nina, would you like to come to the mic, please? I think Duchess Club has again got lucky. I couldn't have thought about a more apt occasion for Mrs. Shashi Taru to be with the Duchess Club, right? Around Valentine's time, girl. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Extremely grateful uh, to Nandita Krishnan for making this happen. I think without her, I'm sure we would not have been able to get even that this close to Shashi, right? So thank you, Nandita, for everything. It's my loss that I'm not with you all. <laughs> Okay, uh, just to tell you, uh, Jeshi, I'm also Aryama Samandi. Right? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, and I remember the only time I saw you was at my daughter's um, reception at Delhi. And there was one man who was standing out. He was the most handsome man. Then guess who? <laughs> Jeshi Tharoor. <laughs> oh, sweet you. Thank you. <laughs> the most dashing man there. And um, thank you very much for being with the uh, Duchess today. And really grateful. I know you're very, very busy. I heard from... Uh, your secretary Koshi, that very busy schedule, but thank you so much for making time for us. Thank you so much, and and love to my dear friend Sayada Farah for making it happen. Thank you. Let's look forward. Thank you so grand. much. Much appreciated. Okay. So shall I begin now, Farah? I'll, I'll I'll introduce you both, Nanita. Okay. Before we start that, uh, Sayada. Yeah. Bangera, as we fondly call her Saida, a very, very dear friend. I have known her since many years, and she is part of our family. An experienced professional with more than 30 years of work. Experience spanning hospitality, business management, and event She is an alumni of the reputed Institute of Hotel Management and Catering Technology, Mumbai, and has worked with the Taj Group and ITC Hotel, amongst others. She lived in Hong Kong, Australia for 20 years before returning to Singapore in 2011 and therefore has ongoing exposure to both culture. Hyderabad is the city where she grew up and belongs to. She currently manages Romancing Hyderabad, an event management company formed to share her passion for the city, its culture, handicrafts, textiles, and the hidden gems of its architecture with others. She organizes conferences and seminars, curated tours and dining experiences that include the Hyderabadi culture. She's an avid reader, and some of her passions are traveling, yoga, trekking, and even classical music. On a personal note, Saida, as she fondly called, is a childhood friend of Mrs. Reena Reddy. She is the least judgmental person we know. She has an objective view of most issues around her and does not get perturbed by anything. We call her the cool chick. We welcome you, Farah, Saida, and please continue from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sujata. Thank you. Dr. Shashi Tharoor and Dr. Nandita Krishna. 
on behalf of the duchess club i am delighted to welcome you both today to this interactive evening discussing books and ideas dr shashi tharoor needs no introduction i doubt there's anyone here who does not know about him but i'll do the formalities anyway dr shashi tharoor is a politician a best selling writer and a former international diplomat he graduated from st stephen's college delhi in 1975 and obtained a doctorate in international relations and affairs from the fletcher school of law and diplomacy tufts university in 1978 he began his career in the united nations in 1978 itself became the un high commissioner for refugees in singapore in 1981 and later un under secretary general for communications and public information he resigned from the un in 2007 and contested for the post of member of parliament from tiruvanthapuram kerala in 2009 a seat he has successfully held for nearly 3 terms currently he is chairman of the parliamentary standing committee on information technology and all india professionals congress dr tarur is known for his eloquent speeches his speech attacking british colonialism delivered at the oxford union in 2015 in a non fiction work resulted sorry resulted in a non fiction work an era of darkness which gave him the sahitya academy award in 2019 has sold over 100000 copies and has been ground breaking forcing a british defense of their history and actions in the indian subcontinent he is a prolific writer known for his wizardry with words having written 22 books both fiction and non fiction and several newspaper and magazine columns he was 10 when he wrote his first adventure novel His great Indian novel has had 23 reprints and is a magnificent adaptation of the Mahabharat to the politics of India's freedom struggle and the Congress politics of Mrs Indira Gandhi. His books cover economics, history, governance and politics, both Indian and international. His latest books are The Battle of Belonging and Tharoorasaurus, a fun-filled collection of impossible words. and interesting anecdotes behind them dr tharoor on a personal note i have to confess that this is a huge fan moment for me in around 1992 a friend in melbourne lent me a book the great indian novel which i have subsequently bought and i was hooked it's absolutely brilliant and i'm glad that we are on zoom today and that i'm seated so i won't swoon and make a fool of myself <laughs> i happen to know i'm not alone there are many others in the audience who feel the same way so thank you for being with us here with us and we look forward to a wonderful evening with you thank you i'm delighted i'm looking forward to too thank you for the very kind words thank you dr nandita krishna is a historian environmentalist and writer based in chennai with a phd in ancient indian culture from bombay university she has been a professor and research guide for the phd program of cpr institute of indological research affiliated to the university of madras she is president of the cp ramaswamy iyer foundation and founder of this of its several institutions and schools she is the author of 23 best selling non fiction works on religion culture and environment nanita and shashi tharoor were childhood playmates in bombay and have remained close friends over the years despite differing political ideas nanita and i also have a personal connect we are both members of iwa in chennai and so we get to interact with each other from time to time in one of our discussions i discovered that she knew my extended family in bombay and also remembered my aunt and uncle coming for her wedding and giving her a beautiful rose garland that memory has stayed with her over all these years 
And it's really wonderful how these connections come up against us, despite us being such a vast country. Nandita, thank you so much for being with us this evening and facilitating this. It's all over to you now. Thank you. We have such a wonderful speaker today that I think I'll just start it off and the rest is up to Shashi. Oh. <laughs> so let's start with your uh, book, which everybody likes the most, which even Farah mentioned, the great Indian. I think however many books you write after that, and I'll ask you about the others too. I think uh, the great Indian novel is probably the greatest of them all. Now, I want to ask you, Shashi, how did you get the idea? All through history, we've been saying Indian politics is like the Mahabharata and so on. And yet you managed to adapt such a complicated book like the Mahabharata, which has 18 books, huge volumes, into a novel <laughs> with Congress and Indira Gandhi. Tell us about it. Well, you know, it, it, it actually is, is an awfully long time ago, but I do remember this fairly vividly. I was, um, uh, you know, I was an avid reader all along and I was reading. May, may I request all those who are not part of this conversation to mute their mics? There's an enormous amount of disturbance uh, because so many other mics are on. If everybody could mute their mics except Nandita and me, it would make for a, a much healthier environment. These, uh, a lot, lot of noise coming in. All right. So to answer another, I happen to be reading, um, uh, as it happens, Pilal's so-called transcreation of the uh, Mahabharata. And I was struck by the liveliness of the language and the immediacy of the narrative. It almost, it always struck me that this was a story that read as if it could have been written today. I mean, today at that point was 1987. But anyway, and I said, um, you know, for 800 years, at least, that we know about, the story of the Mahabharat was told and retold. There were interpolations added, anecdotes added to reflect the great events of the time, to convey didactic messages to the people, to interpolate hagiography about the great rulers. All of these stories kept coming in. And then suddenly after about 800, somewhere around 400 after Christ, we just stopped telling the story. And I asked myself, why do we stop? What would be the case, I asked myself, if we were retelling the Mahabharata today? What would be the great events of our time that we would want to tell? Because in many ways, the Mahabharata was, in Rajaji's memorable phrase, it was the National Library of India, because every story was put into it. And I thought, therefore, what would be the great stories if I was writing, uh, if I was Ved Vyas in the late 1980s? And obviously, the story of the 20th century in India was the story of our um, nationalist movement, the freedom struggle, and the immediate uh, challenges and disappointments of the first few decades after independence. And so I said, look, let's, let's try and do this. And I, I, I started writing. It, it was actually uh, without any planning, any schema. I know it seems unrealistic that I would even launch into such a thing, but I did it almost for the heck of it. And I wrote the first 32 pages. Um, just you know for myself for fun then i put it aside i was working full-time in the un i was doing writing in the evenings i had two small twins who uh, also took up some of my waking hours at night but then one day i remember my brother-in-law coming visiting and i was working in my study and he was sitting in an armchair behind me and he idly picked up this manuscript and started reading and i could see his he was absolutely compelled. He kept going. He reached that last 30-second page and turned it looking for more. And he said, where's the rest? So I said, there isn't any. He said, you've got to write this. It's fabulous. So emboldened by this ins ins inspiration of a supportive reader, I started writing. And I, I must say, I found myself carried along with the flow, enjoying myself. And after, at, uh, after 100 uh, pages or so, I sent it off to a, a literary agent in London I had met socially, just to see whether uh, she would have thought it had any potential. And I was utterly delighted that she came back with great enthusiasm, said, you must finish this and, and there will certainly be uh, a huge and attentive audience. So that was the, 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 the way it all started. But I must say that, you know, as I was writing, taking the characters of the epic, stories, incidents from the epic, and somehow 
relocating them into 20th century India, where Hastinapur becomes a, uh, an Indian princely state taken over by the British. And, and Bhishma, who, as you probably all know, um, also was known as Ganga Datta, the gift of the Ganga, uh, becomes Gangaji in order to remind people of Gandhiji, and he becomes a Gandhiji type character. And I was weaving the narrative in and out. But as I reached independence time, it became very difficult to sustain as a novel. In other words, um, the evolution, the natural evolution of the characters seemed to work up to then, but then it became challenging. So what I did was uh, I gradually converted the characters into walking metaphors. Uh, so that, for example, Draupadi is the progeny of an illicit relationship between the blind visionary nationalist Dhritarashtra, who's the first prime minister of independent India, and the wife of the vice reign. And Draupadi is therefore a product of British colonialism interacting with Indian nationalism. But because she is illicit and cannot be acknowledged, she's given away to be adopted by a low caste servant called Mokrasi. So she's Draupadi Mokrasi, and she becomes a metaphor for democracy and everything that happens to Indian democracy happens to her. And that kind of thing. So the five father brothers are symbols of the five pillars, uh, the five husbands of Indian democracy in that um, Yudhishthira represents law and justice and um, Arjun represents the free press and the spirit uh, of, of, of public opinion. Bhim represents the army, Nakul and Sahadeva, the administrative service and the foreign service. So you find that um, in that last third of the novel, the reader is expected to see through, and I, I don't make it too difficult, I don't think, see through the characters into the larger ideas they're meant to represent. But at the same time, I had a lot of fun, there's a lot of humor, uh, because the Mahabharata is actually a verse, uh, is actually written in poetry, it is not prose. Um, I did what one or two serious translators have done, which is to translate it into prose, but by, 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 by breaking occasionally into verse to convey some of the poetic quality of the original. Except in my case, it wasn't really serious verse for the most part. It was light verse, doggerel, humor, limericks, all that sort of thing. And so the result was a satirical novel that essentially told the story of 20th century India by um, borrowing characters, episodes, personages, philosophies from the Mahabharata and applying them to characters very familiar to most Indians uh, who dominated the 20th century in India. And I, I have to say that I, I wrote it as a first novel, having never written a novel before and not knowing whether I would ever find the time or be encouraged to write another novel again. So I threw everything into it. My ideas about India, my convictions, um, um, wit, humor, jokes, observations, it's all there. And, and uh, the result in many ways, um, perhaps has, has exceeded my own expectations. And then not only was the book very well received, published uh, internationally in England and America, as well as in India, published in translation in many European languages, but it also went on to win a lot of awards. And as you say, it, it's continued to be read. I'm gratified to say it went through uh, uh, some 50 to 53 editions, then they reprinted it again for a millennium edition, that's all that. Then they did a 25th anniversary edition of it in, um, in 2014. That's now in its 23rd printing. So the book has really, I'm always delighted when I see young people who weren't born when the book was written, coming up to me at book events and asking me to sign it. So it really has been for me a, a particularly gratifying success. Like any parent, I don't pick a, a book. I mean, a parent doesn't pick a favorite child. I don't pick a favorite book. But I'll have to admit it, it's, it's fair to be regarded as my, as my most successful and most enduring book. So now the colonialism book, An Era of Darkness, uh, is, is a strong rival and has sold more copies. So there you are. I was coming to that because uh, that was my next question. You know, were you asked to speak about the British in India or did you choose the subject? And of course, that led to an era of darkness, which is really a magnum, a magnum opus. Well, actually, Nandita, that's quite another, uh, you know, all of these things tend to be some of the biggest things you do in life are quite accidental. I was going to the UK anyway uh, for the Hay Festival of Literature. 
I, which I had been a fairly early and fairly regular participant. And, um, and, and I always take a few days extra because I have a sister and nephews uh, in, in London, so I stay with them and so on. And um, Oxford Union happened to write to me saying they were having a debate on the subject uh, that Britain owes reparations to a former colonies and would I speak? And they don't normally pay for you to fly all the way from India and so on. So I probably would have declined were it not for the fact that it was happening a few days. Um, I mean, in fact, a couple of days before I was due to appear in Hay anyway. So I thought, why not do this? My sister said, I will drive you to Oxford and we can drive from Oxford on to Wales. So you can actually do, uh, do this uh, on, on the way to your commitment in here and why. So I said, fine, why not? And I went in a very cheerful spirit. Um, you know, it, it, it was, we were supposed to have eight minutes each. In the end, I ended up having a little more because fortunately the organizers enjoyed my speech so much they forgot to ring the bell. But nonetheless, uh, you don't prepare too much for eight minutes. So I jotted down a few points on a tiny scrap of paper that fitted into the hollow of my hand. And I went out there and they asked me to be the last speaker on the opposition side. Uh, I'm sorry, on the proposition side that is proposing that Britain should uh, offer reparations. Now, I actually was not particularly convinced about reparations myself. I have, I have always felt that the enormous toll exacted by British colonialism on, on India, on Indian civilization, on India's economy and so on, could not be quantified in, um, in, in, in any meaningful financial sense. I always felt that any... Um, reasonable sum of, of, of reparations that could be paid would not be enough to, to, to match the, the damage done. But if you actually calculated the damage done, uh, it could not be paid because the money would be in, insanely high. Therefore, I thought reparations were not the point, but it would be a good opportunity to um, just you know let go of some of my uh, bugbears. I'd be very irritated as a reader over the last 10, 15 years before that to see all the books coming out of England and succeeding even in America where I was living, working for the UN, um, extolling the British empire. Neil Ferguson talking about how India was equipped to succeed with globalization only because the empire had prepared it for it. And Lawrence James calling the British empire in India the greatest act of altruism in human history. And all of this utter balderdash, which the, uh, the apologist for colonialism had put out. And so I thought here is a chance, even in eight minutes, to, to, to give a few corrective points. So I, as I said, I went with a scrap of paper in my hand with a few corrective points. Um, and since I was the, um, the last speaker for the proposition, I had three of the four speakers of the opposition before me and I was able to listen to them and quickly scribble down some of the things they said that I could react to. And then uh, I converted my speech essentially into a rebuttal of all the arguments for British colonialism. And once that was done, as you know, it did go on for a little more than the eight minutes I was allotted, but it was such a success with the audience that they, they you know, they have a, this old fashioned style of voting in Oxford where the audience has to file into a, a division lobby. That is, there is a, there are two rooms off the main hall. And if you are for the proposition, you file into one room. If you are against the property, you file into the other. Somebody comes and does a head count in the so many people wanted to file into the into the lobby for the proposition. There was not enough physical room for them, and they had to count the room, then let more people in, count the room, then let more people in, with the result that the official reception after the uh, event was delayed, and it was a huge success. Anyway, I didn't think much of it. I had fun. I went on to Wales, um, where I've already forgotten what, what I spoke about and here on why. But this uh, Oxford speech then went up on the internet a couple of weeks later, when I was already back in India. And as is my wont, I actually tweeted it, uh, saying, you know, here's my speech on the subject, etc. I just couldn't believe the reaction. Uh, uh, it just completely took off. Within 24 hours, 3 million people had downloaded it. Um, it, became, it just somehow seized the imagination of Indians. And, um, and, and uh, within a short while, my publisher telephoned me saying, you've got to make a book out of this. I said, wait a minute, why make a book out of this? Because uh, surely everybody in India already knows uh, what I said. And he said, listen, if everyone knew your arguments, your speech wouldn't have gone viral. So that seemed logical enough. And so I said, all right, I'll write a book. But I'd written off more than, more than, because you know, it's one thing to have a few arguments for an eight minute speech. 
quite another to do the research to substantiate and back it up to also try and catch up with the state of the art in terms of contemporary research on all these issues and then to to structure a book that uh, can be adequately supported footnoted stand up to scrutiny to critics and all of that so I, it was an enormous job and i found myself collecting a lot of material i enlisted a couple of researchers to dig up things for me that i didn't have time to go and, and look up from you know academic journals and so on and um and fortunately um his majesty the king of bhutan very kindly said you know anyone want to write uh, i'll give you one of my cottages a mini palace is what it turned out to be out in the hills you'll be cut off from hills no one can reach you you can write in peace and that's exactly what i needed it was a bit of a risk for a politician to do that but 20 2016 uh, sorry 20 yeah 2016 um, summer i think july um i think i was two years into my into my second term i thought i could take two weeks away i went off for two weeks uh my sim card in india my indian sim card didn't work no one could reach me and i just read and wrote 18 hours a day uh, what I, that succeeded in doing was to break the back of the research that is i had so much material saved on my laptop drive um literally hundreds of volumes of books going uh, in many cases some original documents of the uh, 18th and 19th centuries house of commons testimonies books published at that time in the british colonial era that i think in the normal course it would have been impossible um without spending literally months or years um i remember how i wrote my phd for example uh back in the 70s before the internet i, I must have devoured hundreds of books then too written out notes in little slips of paper or index cards put them all away in boxes and took them out reorganized them according to the themes and the subjects in the chapters then started writing uh, it would have been a, a very challenging task but thanks to modern technology i was able to get all this down so i was able in this first draft written in bhutan um to essentially lay out the thrust and the theme of my argument and having done so i sent it off to my indian publisher and also to my british agent they were both terribly excited really loved it i said i'm not done this is just going to be about half the book so there's a lot more i need to add to substantiate and develop certain arguments but that i was then able to come back to my normal life of parliament and the constituency and all that and even in a couple of hours a day without that kind of sustained focus i was able to insert interpolate add and write the book so that became uh, the way i wrote that book and that again was uh, was something which uh, did phenomenally well it is still i'm told um if you exclude textbooks it is the best selling hardback ever published in india so that's that's a wonderful wonderful feeling uh, people really le- read it and and related to it you are mute nandita nandita you are muted i have a personal con- connect to that book because you sent it to me to check out the history and i sent you a lot of points about it. So I you did indeed and and that and why I'm a Hindu were both books in which I valued your feedback greatly. So th- that was a wonderful book because I I really wish it is a textbook for any of your books textbook Shashi in any university anywhere Well the, the great Indian novel um has been and probably still is somewhere or the other prescribed uh, as a text in uh either commonwealth literature or literatures of the world or post colonial writing or subjects like that um mm-hmm. i don't think anybody in india is studying it or maybe some are because every once in a while i do get an email often from a rather obscure university in india from somebody who claims to have written a phd on my book so i have given fodder there are something like 300 doctoral theses on my book so but that may not mean that it's a required text it means that they are persuaded the thesis advisor that this was something worth writing about again you're muted nandita you might leave your mic on it's fine as long as others mute it we'll be all right uh, somebody is muting me okay um what about an era of darkness i think that is a book every indian should read and you know should read when he she is a student in college how many colleges universities make their students read it even in the history department right well i must say that um, 
that that uh, when the book came out, um, uh, the then education minister Prakash Javlekar telephoned me late one night. It was almost midnight, saying, "I have just finished the book. It's fantastic. I couldn't put it down. It really must be required reading in our country." I said, "You're the education minister. You can make it so." And we both laughed. But I knew perfectly well that, unfortunately, in these days, in these days of very polarized politics in our country, that a book written by a Congress MP will never get any official patronage from the powers that be. And so it has proved. I have to, I have to admit that none of the books that you and I have been talking about have uh, been given any sort of uh, public national recognition by any of the authorities. I'm pleased to say the Era of Darkness did win the Sahitya Academy Award, uh, which of course is given by an independent jury. Um, and the, the, um, it, it won a few private awards at the Ramnath Goen Cup Prize and so on. But um, I, I think we are living in a rather poisoned political environment where many things that I may say or do that the government would agree with, they'd be reluctant to publicly admit agreeing with. But when I made my Oxford speech, it still is a matter of some pride that the Prime Minister and the Speaker of the House were both kind enough to publicly acknowledge uh, uh, their liking my, my, my speech. So, at least I got that. Shashik, we can't talk about all your books because that will take a couple of hours, more, much more. But your latest, <laughs> your latest two books are The Battle of Belonging and Tarurosaurus. We will end with Tarurosaurus okay. because fun than uh, serious writing. Your Battle of Belonging is the latest book. And there are so many issues, you know, you have about five or six sections. So we can't discuss every one of them. The only one thing I would like to ask you is that um, times change, you know. Today, the Constitution is our Samhita, our Shastra. But you know, once upon a time, we had Manu Samhita, we've had Patanjali, so many which have come and gone. And so do you think the Constitution is a living document or an inadequate document? You know, it has been changed so many times within the very first amendment was in 1951, which effectively abolished the right to private property. Then the four, Seventh Amendment divided the states on linguistic lines which was the first splitting of India on different lines. And then, you know, when socialism it, it became a part of the constitution, you're denying other political theories. And there have been a total of 104 con uh, constitutional amendments. So none of them have been uh, written in stores. So isn't the constitution, isn't politics, everything, people's response to a situation. That's an, yeah, that's an absolutely fair point, Anita, uh, because essentially, um, you're right, it's a living document, it's one which has been amended a hundred times and therefore one cannot say it's sacrosanct. But if you can look at what's been amended and what's not been, you come to the so-called basic structure doctrine that have been actually, that has been enunciated by um, the Supreme Court. And the basic structure doctrine, as you know, essentially says you can amend pretty much anything, but some things you can't that are key to it. You cannot suddenly declare ourselves not to be a democracy. You cannot abolish um, the, the, the separation of powers. You cannot suddenly uh, change uh, fundamental rights and so on. Now, one of the issues that's come up with me is that in this book, I have argued that and I, as you know, I start off by describing the various kinds of nationalism that exist in the world. And after talking about the various kinds of nationalism, I reduced them essentially to two kinds. One anchored in various issues of identity, ethnic identity, religious identity, linguistic identity, uh, racial identity, and so on. Or those that are what one might call civic nationalism. That is where it rests not on identities, but on constitutions and institutions. And I believe that the choice that our founding fathers and mothers made between 1947 and 1950 was so fundamental. They chose that India should be a civic uh, national state, a state in which everybody, irrespective of their identity, their religion, their caste, their language, their, their region, 
would have equal rights. And that fundamental choice was actively debated. For example, somebody did stand up in the Constituent Assembly and say, listen, since Pakistan has been created as a country for Muslims, let's declare ourselves as a country for Hindus. And this was debated. And having debated it, the founding, uh, the, the constitution makers said, no, we fought a freedom struggle for everyone. And therefore the country we create, the constitution we write must be for everyone. So to my mind, that's very fundamental to what India is all about. I know that the phrase, the idea of India has perhaps been overused and, and some people uh, particularly associated with the ruling party tend to say that this, uh, there's more than one idea of India, who gave you a monopoly on the idea of India, all of that. And I, I don't really want to go into that uh, because as far as I'm concerned, I accept there are many ideas of India and certainly the idea of a Hindu Rashtra, which is their idea, is fundamentally different from my idea of India. And we can certainly legitimately debate that in the political hustings. But as I've said also, even if you take the word secular out of the constitution, it remains a secular constitution because the fact that you have a constitution that guarantees equality, that guarantees freedom of religion, freedom of worship, and even freedom to propagate your own faith, all of that essentially leaves you with a secular system, or at least um, a system in which all religions are deemed to be equal. The same with all languages, other than those listed in the, in the schedule, Indians have a right uh, to be educated in their own mother tongues or to, to speak and use their own languages. No one region of India is supposed to be favored over another. So this idea, in contrast with the Hindi, Hindutva, Hindustan idea uh, that uh, the ruling um, elements have tended to promote, uh, is to my mind um, uh, non-negotiable. But we can argue and debate it, and that's what I've tried to do in the book. Um, yes, there is a possibility that uh, they could amend the constitution and declare India to be a Hindu Rashtra, it would still have to be a Hindu Rashtra anchored in equality, freedom of religion, everything else, or they would have to tear up the constitution and write a new one. What's interesting is that the Hindutva voices have historically always rejected the constitution and talked about the need to have a new one that's much more anchored in uh, Indian Hindu Vedic traditions. But now they're not talking their language. They're saying that everything they're doing is within the spirit of the constitution. And I'm debating in this book against their understanding of what India is all about. I too think of India as an ancient civilization, but my understanding of Indian civilization is that it was vast, it contained multitudes, it incorporated diversities. Um, one of the reasons that, that Hinduism, as I've described in, in my book, Why I'm a Hindu, uh, has been such a successful faith and lasted so long is because it absorbed differences rather than um, fighting them and, 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 and yielding or, or otherwise to them. And so this capaciousness of the Hindu faith uh, is also something that imbues our constitution's own capaciousness. And I'd like to see that continue. Shashi, I agree with you that the constitution says all this, but it's the same government, the same party, which after saying everything must be equal, removed it and I'll tell you how they did it. Now, when we were growing up, I had a vague idea that you spoke Malayalam at home. I presumed you, I, did, I never thought about your religion. And if anybody had told me that you were a Naya, I didn't know what a Naya was. That's how we grew up. We knew nothing about each other's religion or caste or creed or anything. That's right. Today, I mean, not today, over the years, what happened? The government changed. Every child, when my son went to school, I had to fill in his religion, his caste, his mother tongue. My God, I mean, he is sort of, this is his identity. And they force us to do it. Once you do it, I'll tell you an, an example. In one of our schools, our schools never used to ask it, thinking, okay, we are an, one of our schools is an ICSE school. The state board schools were forced to ask these questions, but the uh, ICSE never did. Then we were told we had to. Two scheduled caste parents came to us and said, the reason we put our children in your school is because you never asked these details. And now right. why are you doing it? They're very upset. Now, I think the minute you do that, 
you know the teacher says okay this child is from my community my language the children start knowing about each other and that is bad you know you should not have the children if a parent wants to get any uh, special uh, whatever you call it reservations or something he can produce papers at that time but from the time a child enters school at the age of 3 till he leaves school college university goes to a job he is branded right through his life so where can you have a non communal secular anything you know they are you and i never thought of each other as hindus or tamilians or malayalis or anything we were just friends but that's no longer the quest that's no longer the situation and that has not been for at least since the 70s things changed in the 70s i agree with you i couldn't agree with you more i mean i like you uh, grew up in cosmopolitan bombay of the 1960s where um uh, and that too my parents uh, like yours were from that generation that didn't stress the differences uh, they were part of this whole first generation of nationalist triumph and um, and i remember all sorts of my friends coming home to play and never once was caste or religion mentioned by my parents i never knew that in the course of my of my time i had actually had friends who were hindu muslim parsi christian sikh Uh, of all castes or backgrounds or regions of the country uh, i was never made to feel that any of their identity determined uh, who they were or my uh, the quality of my relationship with them and that's essentially the ideal i remember all those days when politicians would make boring speeches about national integration i never thought i'd miss them but now i do because in fact it's national disintegration that politicians are preaching with impunity sorry okay before i let clara ask her questions i must end with the thuro soros i had a lot of fun with that shashi but i don't think i can ever as a writer i don't think i could use most of those words but i i took about an hour to write one sentence which i shall tell you and you can explain if you understand it shashi in thuro soros It is obvious that your epicaricacy knows no bounds when you watch others suffering from lethalgia while trying to be optimists leading to their defenestration. <laughs> <laughs> well, epicaricacy is taking malicious pleasure in the misfortunes of others, which is something I never do, I assure you. That book does. <laughs> Lethalgia is being at a loss of words, not being able to recall the right word. Uh, Obstimates are people who are learning late in life. And uh, what was your final uh, defenestration? Is literally to throw someone out of the window. So to jettison a person, an idea, uh, whatever it may be, is to defenestrate them. So um, uh, you're suggesting that I am taking malicious pleasure out of other people not being able to recall difficult words that they're trying to learn late in life. and i'm throwing them out of the window i promise you i'm not at all like that i love talking to people in whatever words they find comfortable using and hearing <laughs> which is agatho agatho caco logical flossy now simile vilification i'm sure i'm spelling it wrong it wrong agatha caco logical simply means a mixture of good and evil ours is an agatha caco logical world and uh, floxinos in hilip qualification wow. is merely merely the act of estimating something as worthless something or someone so when i publish my book the paradoxical prime minister in order to draw some attention to its existence i tweeted i want to assure you all this is more than just a 500 page exercise in floxinos in hilip qualification and that needless to say got talked about and people looked it up and so uh that's how the book got the attention it got when it first came out tara thank you nandita so dr thank you dr sir. yes so dr darud there are few questions that i have collated and our members have sent in but i'll start off with the personal one so uh-huh. what made you think of politics you well, came back 
after many years and a very successful career abroad, which is fine. But then you join politics when most people run in the opposite direction. That's true. Uh, it's not that your family is in politics, so it's not hereditary. No. And we all know politics is a dirty game. You've said that yourself in your book, true, true. Battle of Belonging, where you know there's a visible criminal presence, and we all are aware of that. There is no minimal a minimum education. So, what was your pull, and what has your journey been like? Well, to be honest, Farah, I I, uh, I sort of stumbled into it. I didn't expect to. First of all, for the reason you mentioned, I don't have a family pedigree in politics, uh, and normally you assume in Indian politics that without uh, either a, a genetic inheritance or, or, or a godfather to pull you up, you're not going to be able to get into this very closed world, what the French call a chasse garde, which is what Indian politics is. So though I was always interested in the ideas involved in politics, and as you know, I've written a lot of books about policy and, and political issues, I didn't expect I'd ever be a participant. And I'd spent 29 years uh, working on the global international stage, met a lot of international statesmen and stateswomen, presidents, prime ministers, and monarchs, uh, uh, literally in, in small rooms with three or four of us, and, and really could understand in many ways um, that uh, most of them are really no different from you and me. I mean, you know, they, they just happen to be in those positions, but there's nothing that magical, mystical, or, or uh, unapproachable about them. If they can do it, we can do it too. But still, I never thought there was a way of doing it. To somewhat to my surprise, when I contested for the post of UN Secretary General and lost, and decided I still believe rightly that I should now leave the UN, which is somewhat premature because I was just 50 years old and um, I wasn't uh, you know, due for retirement or anything. And in fact, the victor, Ban Ki-moon, very graciously invited me to continue at the UN. Nonetheless, I thought I should move on. And, and I moved on um, uh, initially to do sort of consultancies, which was paying far better than the UN was, traveling to India regularly uh, because of my interest in India, but also because the consultancy I was doing uh, required me to try and explore investment opportunities in India. So I was doing all of that and meeting politicians when I was coming. And to my surprise, I was offered, uh, I, was, I, was, I was tapped on the shoulder by all of the three major national formations in the country. A former minister in the Vajpayee government uh, came to see me in New York even before I'd left the UN and said, come and join us. Um, a, um, the Kerala communist government, a couple of ministers spoke to me and said, would you be interested in joining us? Uh, which, uh, and in both cases, I was a bit mystified because I could only conclude that they hadn't done much reading because the BJP would know that I had articulated for many years my opposition to their bigotry uh, as, as a political uh, agenda I had been a strong, you know, I'd, I'd written in strong condemnation of many of the things they basically stood for. And I'd been equally condemnatory of uh, the political agenda of the communists. So I had no idea why, on the economic agenda too. So I had no idea why they thought I might be sympathetic, possibly because my columns in the Indian papers uh, had, had shown me out to be fairly fierce in some of my views. Uh, and, and each could find somebody, uh, you know, some views that they would agree with. But when the Congress asked me, I was much more tempted because um, the Congress was no longer the Congress of which I had been a staunch critic in the 70s and 80s. After the liberalization of 91, it had abandoned some of the economic uh, uh, dogmas that I had criticized. And uh, in the course of the rise of the Hindutva movement, it had demonstrated itself to be a staunch defender of, of secular values and uh, freedoms, which I thought were precious to uphold in India. So for these reasons, that was the most convenient. So I said, why not? I had no idea what, what I was getting into because I'd never fought an election. I'd never even witnessed an election because I left India at the age of 19. Uh, and, and I had never even seen, uh, I had not even voted in an election until I became a participant in one. But I'm glad the Congress party took a chance on me because uh, I felt that in a democracy, the one way you can make a difference for your own people, as opposed to making a difference for the abstraction that is humanity as a whole, is by getting involved in politics. And I thought uh, if people like me uh, stay away from politics, then the middle class, the educated, uh, 
urban professional community and so on that I identify with would continue complaining and bitching about the politicians because they get the politician they deserve since they don't seek to be in politics themselves. So I said, let me try and put my feet where my mouth was and my writing was. I had, in fact, one of my columns in the Times of India or the Hindu, I can't remember which one, uh, in the first decade of the century was about how in America, uh, uh, I think seven of the previous eight presidential and vice presidential candidates had all been products of Ivy League universities. Whereas in India, with the exception of Manmohan Singh had been to Oxford, uh, nobody in high office had ever had a worthwhile education. And I'd written a column saying that. And here I was as a quote unquote educated Indian being given a chance to actually do what I was holding up as a model to be admired. So I said, let's try. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done, those three weeks of campaigning in 2009, the hottest day of the year, uh, not just 18 hour days, on three or four occasions, there were 23 hour days where I would collapse exhausted at 3 a.m. and have to wake up at four to start again at five. It was just utterly exhausting. Um, I lost, I, I was fairly slim at the time, but I lost even more weight at that time because I was so completely worn out. But at the end of it all, I, I won with a record majority and I'm proud to say the voters of Tiruvannathapuram have brought me back three times. It's been hard. Uh, the first year was uh, not only the first election, but the first year after winning was very rough because I was simply unprepared for the amount of viciousness that was promptly unleashed. A lot of people saw me as an interloper, as somebody who was a misfit, as one magazine cover called me, as somebody who didn't belong in the world of Indian politics. So many lies were told about me. So many things I said were distorted and blown up into controversies that they should never have been uh, controversial. Um, so many things I said were ma malicious and distorted. Finally, uh, I, I ended that first year in politics by actually resigning my ministership. Uh, but I'm pleased to say I didn't give up. I plugged away. I toiled away in my constituency. And uh, a couple of years later, I was back in government again as a minister. But meanwhile, having earned the credibility uh, in my constituency that was to stand me in good stead in future elections. So sometimes, you know, all these nasty things turn out for the best. But I've been through all the Agni Parikshas that, uh, that one likes to talk about in the classical text. We admire your courage because it just does need that courage to do what you have done. Thank you. So I'll come to something again that you've spoken about, India versus Bharat. So India being the elite urban India versus the rural rustic Bharat. Um, and they are both very distinct. Now, when our constitution was written, it was um, the no dominant voices in India were Western, educated, secular, liberal. Today, our society has changed. The middle class has come up. And um, so, and, and, and they say that, as you've mentioned in your book, um, they're impatient with the liberal elites who are painted out as out of touch, who are painted as out of touch feckless and compromised by divided loyalties. So why should the constitution not reflect the aspirations of the dominant of today? I know Nandita has asked the question and you said something about the constitution, but if that is now becoming more and more of a majority view. Well, you know, this is something which uh, I've talked about in the battle of belonging and not just about India, it's a global phenomenon where a number of populists have actually risen saying that they are more authentic representatives of their people and attacking the so-called rootless cosmopolitans who have dominated their country's politics, whether it's America, whether it's India, whether it's Turkey, you find the same sort of phenomenon, even in England, uh, Brexit is, is a reflection of that sort of mm -hmm. attitude. So what you're seeing in many ways is uh, uh, a current that's global where a, a populist backlash against uh, cosmopolitanism and against uh, what they would disparage as elitism um, is, is widespread. Now in India, uh, it's, it's turned out, you know, the, the message of many of those who voted for Mr. Modi and those who campaigned for Mr. Modi is, these people who are not genuinely Hindu or are even anti-Hindu in their vocabulary, these people who speak English rather than Hindi, these people who don't identify with what we consider precious, 
uh, why should they be ruling our country? It should be us and that sort of thing. Uh, your right has apparently appealed to 37% of the voters in the last election and 31% before that. But to cut a very, very long story short, um, I do believe that 63% of the people are waiting to be mobilized against that attitude. Uh, it's just that we have a very divided and fractious polity where so many parties divide that 63% vote that the, um, the 37 wins um, essentially um, a sweeping majority in our first past the post system in parliament. But I would argue that um, there is still a battle worth waging and that's what I'm trying to do in, in my political life. Um, I realize the clock is ticking and I won't have a lot of time to be able to try and pull it off, but I intend to, to, to do my very best. And you know, um, a, a lot of what we do is a reflection of the, of the party uh, we are in, uh, the organizational vehicle we are stuck with, the leaders we are working with and so on. And so not everything would be everyone's taste, but for me, politics is above all about ideas and principles. And ideas, the values, the principles that I believed in from the days of my upbringing and my schooling are the ideas, values, and principles I define, I defend, irrespective of whatever flaws may exist in these sort of structures through which I have to pursue these ideas. I think a lot of us also believe in the same. I'm just trying to be the devil's advocate. So but I'm afraid um, this will have to be the last question because my next meeting is already pawing at the door. Okay, I'll ask you just one last one. Um, you have said that um, the Kashmir episode was a reminder that constitutional promises made by governments should not be broken. Okay, that's absolutely true. And you have also uh, brought up, uh, you have lamented the continuous weakening of the important pillars of our democracy. Example, the legal system, the press, the CBI, etc. But this has started long before the current government came into power. And I did see what you told Nandita that when you joined the Congress, it was a very different Congress to what you had criticized. But having said that, um, they are still not opening up to the younger, aggressive leaders who may come up and who, you know, who want to be there. They, it's, it's just the support of one family. And therefore, Question one, did they fritter away their opportunity to be a viable, strong party? And now, have they abdicated their responsibility uh, as opposition? Because if they're not getting the kind of, if even um, people like me and Nandita, we were having a chat before, who have been traditional supporters of the Congress, are really disappointed at what's going on. And this is the time uh, we really need a strong opposition of all the times, I think. I think so, because the fact is that, you know, in any country that calls itself a democracy, it's unhealthy to have just one dominant view that dominates everything, dominates the media, dominates judiciary, dominates parliament, dom dominates public spaces, and essentially uh, leaves very little room for anything else. I, I'm appalled by many of the things that are going on in, in our country in the name of our democracy. Uh, as you know, I've had a few FIRs slapped against me for an innocuous tweet that was since uh, that was deleted within half an hour of issuance and that itself actually called uh, for everyone to abjure violence. Uh, uh, but, but that apart, you know, you've got a comedian being arrested and jailed for 15 days for a joke he didn't crack. Uh, you, you, you've got uh, uh, internet being snapped uh, around Delhi because the farmers were using it to get their message out and so on and so forth. These are not practices that I ever expected to see in the democracy in which I grew up in. And I believe, therefore, that there is a moral urgency to continue to fight for the right values. I believe there are many in the opposition who feel that, uh, but, uh, yes, the institutions have in many ways been hollowed out or compromised. And that makes it much more of a challenge for us, because when the institutions that we can rely upon to be independent and neutral may not always perform in that way, the, the battle is that much harder to fight. But I do believe that our country is fundamentally by nature uh, uh, an accommodative, inclusive kind of country, a country in which people would rather get along with everyone else despite ob obvious differences. Swami Vivekananda always preached the acceptance of difference as key to his understanding of Hinduism. And to me, it's key to my understanding of democracy. 
Uh, we just have to let others be themselves so long as they don't interfere with our right to be ourselves. And on that basis, there's room for all sorts of beliefs. I certainly believe that the opposition still has an important role to play, and I'm going to do my very best to continue to play it. Thank you. I, I apologize. I, I see that on the chat, which I've just opened, there are literally dozens of questions come in that, uh, that I have not had a chance to read or respond to. I'll pick one out at random, which seems a good one to end on. Uh, Kannan Chakravarti asked, do you wish to be known as politician writer or writer politician? I think the answer is very clear that while I'm in politics, it does take precedence over anything else and that I write in the time that I can carve out from fulfilling my duties to my constituents, to my voters uh, and to my, to my politics. But I'm already a former minister. One day I'll be a former MP. I hope never to be a former writer. So that ultimately will be, I hope, the, the epitaph. Thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure. I'm sorry that I couldn't be at the Severa Hotel with all the duchesses, but um, uh, one day uh, it'll be wonderful to see you all in person. And thank you so much for uh, having me on your, on your Zoom. We board. look forward to that. Thank you. Namaskar of Jehan. I'll just hand over to Anu Agarwal to just thank okay. you formally. And sure. uh, we go from there. Anu? In person in Chennai and Duchess Club. Yes, very soon. And that was, wow, a very engaging and an informative uh, evening. And I take this opportunity on behalf of the Duchess to thank Shri Shashi Tarurji, our most charming guest speaker of the day. And thank you, sir, for taking out the time from your busy schedule to address the Duchess Club. And not to say thank you, Dr. Nandita and Saida, for making it so engaging. Your questions were really engaging and made the evening even more informative. And not the least, thank you, Sujata, and our team at Savera for all the technical support given to us. Thank you so much, Jay Hind. Thank you. Nina, Rati, Anu, all on the screen, please. Come closer to the mic, please. Just look at the camera. Can you come closer towards the computer, please? Yeah. 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 Right. Can we Can take a start? picture, sir? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. One, two, three. You might want to highlight uh, the uh, Severa ladies on yes. the main screen. Yes, I'm going to that just way you, they'll be more visible. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Doctor. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Short and sweet. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nandita. One second, I'm unmuting you, Doctor. Thank you, Farah. Thank you, Sujata. Thank you, Sujata, for managing the. Sorry, Dr. Nandita, I needed to mute you because there was some disturbance in the mic which was coming when Shashi was talking. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, because his secretary was sending me messages. Yeah, and so, everything else was muted because it was just muted. They can't unmute themselves. Yes, Sharda Srinivasan, you can unmute yourself. Amita, you can. Yeah, I just wanted to say hi to Nandita. Hi, Surabhi. <laughs> How are you? I think all right. Nice to have a chance to hear you and see you. So lovely. I know it's tough to that, but cousins, we have to meet on meet virtually. Yeah. <laughs> so this is. Dr. Sharta Srinivasan, who is in, the, in Nias, Bangalore. She's an eminent professor, Padmashri, so on. Lovely. Yeah, I, I, I'm today in a bit of a not, it's a bit of a messy household look, but I just want to say hi to Nandita Kras. Anyway, it was a lovely event. Thank you for all of you. It was good to, you know, join you all. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I love to teach you. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank and you. how is the grandchild doing? Lovely. Give uh, my love to your husband. And I'll do that. Dasya. Take care, ma. Thanks. All of you can get your video. Nandita, well. thank you so much, Nandita. Thank you for making it happen. Rati speaking from Samira Hotel. Thank you so much.
Nanita and Saida, both of you. Farah, I didn't know who they were talking about. I never knew your name was Saida. Oh, Saida. yeah, we call her Saida. Farah, yeah, we call her Saida. <laughs> Nandita, there's a very funny story behind that. So my name is Sayeda Farah. And, when it, and I was called Farah till I joined secondary school and my teacher couldn't pronounce Farah. So she my said, God. what kind of a name is this that your parents have given you? This is no name. I'm going to change it to have one more name, Sayeda. So I'm going to call you Sayeda. And this was in fourth class. And, you know, we never, we just accepted things as they were. I never said, no, that's not, my name is supposed to be. So all my school friends call me Sayeda. And Nina is one of them, as you know. So, so, but other than my secondary school friends, my primary school teachers, my work, my college, my family, I'm Farah to the rest of the world.